You're listening to Staying in the Game, a Plum Dragon Herbs podcast where we have conversations about mindset and techniques for staying at the top of your game. I'm your host, Janelle Leatherwood. Today we will be speaking with Master Jeff Webb, who is a sixth degree and the chief instructor of the National Wing Chun Organization. A former private student of Grandmaster Lung Team, Daisifu Webb has studied martial arts for over 37 years in the USA, Europe, and also in Hong Kong. He is based in Austin, Texas, where he instructs martial arts, defensive tactics, and firearms. A sought-after instructor, he has been popular on the national seminar circuit for more than 20 years, and he has authored a number of articles over the years, in addition to his recent book, The Empty Cup, which is geared towards helping martial arts students stay in the game. Welcome to the show today. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I understand that you also have a side job. You want to tell us a little bit about that as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, So I'm a a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, and uh, most people in the military are into uh, martial arts, and they're also into firearms. (laughs) So... uh, uh, when I'm not teaching martial arts, uh, on the side, I work part-time at a gun range here in Texas. Uh, I'm a safety officer, which means I keep people from pointing guns at other people. Uh, yesterday, I had another one pointed at me, so uh, uh. <laughs> it becomes a common common thing. Um, I'm a safety officer. Um, I'm an NRA certified instructor on uh, rifle, pistol, and shotgun. And I'm a licensed to carry instructor here in Texas as well for people that want to get their uh, concealed carry or licensed to carry. And, um, yeah, so I do that a couple of times a week, and uh, my primary thing is I teach. I teach martial arts. I teach weaponless defense for a, an Army buddy of mine who runs a security guard company um, for the folks to get their, uh, you know, level, what's called a level three security guard here in Texas where they can carry a gun. They actually have to have three hours of weaponless, you know, non-firearms uh, defensive tactics, and so I teach that as well. And, um, yeah, I teach Kung Fu, weaponless defense, and uh, how to shoot people. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> how, okay. how, how not to get shot, actually. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the things we, you know, a, lo- a lot of people have a misconception. Uh, I am a Texan, born and raised, and, uh, you know, people have the conception that, well, you know, people in Texas are gun happy. And, you know, the fact is, is when I teach license to carry, one of the things we cover is, is nonviolent dispute resolution. You really do not want to have to pull out a gun and shoot somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, I always tell people if you with martial arts, if you get in a fist fight, someone's going to get hit and hurt. If you get into a, a a fight with edged weapons, a knife, somebody's going to get cut. And when you bring firearms into the equation, it's it's even worse. I mean, somebody's going to get shot and probably going to lose their life. Um, you know, and the the repercussions for that are a lot worse than if you you know if you use your martial arts to defend yourself. That doesn't go before a grand jury in the state of Texas. If you use a yeah. firearm. You need an attorney, right. definitely. So, but yeah, that's uh, that's what I do on the side. Okay. So, well, when you said you had a gun pointed at you yesterday, what did you? Um, was that like an aggressive thing, or were you teaching? Somebody? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> I've been. I've been. Uh, uh, I don't know if I want to say I've been pretty lucky, or they've been pretty lucky. It's never been an aggressive thing. Um, I've been working at this particular gun range for almost four years. And, uh, you know, you get people of all, it's, it's like martial arts. You get some people in your class that they've never done anything before, and you get guys in there and, and ladies as well that have trained for, you know, 15 or 20 years that know their way around. Firearms right. are the same thing. At a gun range, you get people in there, and they'll sign the waiver up front and say, oh, yeah, I know how to shoot. And then they get back there, and, you know, they have a rental gun, and when they take it out of the, the little bin that they carry it back in, you can tell when they look at it like they've never seen a gun before that they don't know what they're doing. And these guys yesterday, two gentlemen, um, said they knew what they were doing, got back there. They asked me for some help. I showed them how to load it and how to, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, The guy didn't know how to unload it, so he turned around to ask me and in the process pointed the gun at me. Um, Fortunately, I've been doing Wing Chun for for several decades, and uh, I'm pretty quick. And believe me, when someone points a gun at you, you can move a lot quicker than you think. So... uh, I, I rushed forward, I grabbed the gun, I pointed it down range, uh, and scolded the guy. And, uh, you know, he, 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 it was not a malicious thing. You know, most right. people that, 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 you know, same thing in martial arts. If, um, you know, 
I teach Kung Fu, which comes from China. And folks that are not familiar with the intricacies of Eastern culture may come in and, you know, do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing or whatever, um, just because they're unfamiliar with the cultural requirements or, or norms. Same thing with firearms, you know. People may not be familiar with the proper safety procedures, and that's my job is to teach them that. So, right. uh, and I'm in one piece today, so uh, oh, that's, that's a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, that sounds pretty crazy. Um, no. Well, now you've been on the national seminar circuit. You said for more than twenty years. Um, tell me yes. a little bit about that. Well. Um, the National Wing Chun Organization is my own organization. I, uh, I broke with my former instructor, Grandmaster Lung Ting. I broke with him back in 2007. And, oh, wow, that's been 13 years ago. Uh, prior to that, uh, I had been teaching for his organization and doing seminars around the country uh, and also in Canada. So essentially how it works is, you know, uh, Taekwondo, for example, there's Taekwondo, you know, all over the place. It's, it's uh, you know, it grew very, very rapidly. You've got a lot of high-level people. Um, you know, jujitsu, the same thing. Uh, but with the Chinese arts, you know, historically here in the U.S., the Chinese were very kind of guarded. Uh, even mm-hmm. when Bruce Lee taught, you know, he was he got into some trouble because he was teaching uh, Caucasians, African Americans, uh, non-Chinese people. Uh, you know, so kung fu has always been, uh, at least in, in you know, twenty, thirty, forty years ago, a, a lot harder to come across. And so in Wing Chun, um, you know, we've got groups of people all over the country, uh, you know, different Wing Chun organizations, and basically they don't live near a high-ranked instructor, so they invite a high-ranked instructor out. And so what I'm going to do, in fact, this weekend I'll be in Boston. Uh, My student out there, he's a fourth degree under me. Um, I'll fly out there Thursday. I'll teach uh, private lessons to one of his assistants on Thursday night. Friday morning he'll show up at the hotel room. We'll train for four or five hours privately. And then Friday evening, I'll teach a seminar at his school, uh, and then all day Saturday. And basically, I teach a group seminar, I correct his students, uh, I conduct testing for the people that are ready to rank up, and um, yeah. And so, uh, that supplements, you know, that, that gives him an avenue for advanced training, uh, and gives him also a chance to have me do a quality check on his own students and, you know, keep everyone progressing and learning. Because mm-hmm. uh, there's not, you know, there's not high level. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a high level Wing Chun person in every city. Right. Um, so, but that works to my benefit because I, I get invited to visit a bunch of nice places. Mm-hmm. And, and how would you say that your philosophy of teaching is maybe different from other instructors? Well, uh, I have a kind of a, a unique perspective. Uh, I studied here under Grandmaster Lung Ting, and, and it was the same thing. Um, and he was, he's my Sifu, uh, my Kung Fu father. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, my Sifu would come to the U.S. He started coming in the early 80s, and he would do the same thing. He would do a seminar. You know, they'd do some in, in the Bay Area on the, East Co- on the West Coast, uh, Montana. He'd hit Texas. He'd hit New York, and then he was off to Europe. And, you know, the folks that were studying over here, my, my seniors, my older Kung Fu brothers, um, you know, they were trying to, you know, learn the system, become better, be able to teach their own students, kind of move up in rank, that sort of thing. And so when I started over here, it was not really very well organized. Uh, and the standard of instruction in the U.S., unfortunately, was not, was not that great. Um, but the best thing that happened to me was enlisting in the U.S. Air Force. I got sent to Germany, and the European organization under Grandmaster Lung Ting uh, was quite a bit older, quite a bit more established. And the gentleman that runs that, who's he's, he's a Grandmaster now, Grandmaster Keith Kernspeck, um, he was a very experienced martial artist as well as instructor. He held black belts in judo, jiu-jitsu, several styles of karate, taekwondo, um, he was, uh, he was an educator himself as well. So he was, you know, very versed in teaching theory and the European organization was, you know, decades, literally decades ahead of us skill wise, uh, of us guys here in the U S. So I studied under here in the American organization and then I went to Europe and when I was stationed in Germany, I, I trained, I went to every class I could. I attended weekend seminars, everything that was in my area. I would even travel. So I did a lot of training and in that, uh, three and a half years that I was stationed in Germany, it had a real impact on my training because the Europeans took the same system of Wing Chun, but mm-hmm. you know, every, every good instructor develops their own 
um, kind of view of the system and, and comes up with some good drills and things. So I have a lot of the European influence. And then after that, I also studied privately with my own Sifu for, for many years, uh, one-on-one. And so I have the, what I feel is the best of the Asian approach to how Wing Chun should be taught, you know, the more traditional way, and the European approach, which is the best in the Western world. So I, I kind of merge the two in, in my own organization. Mm-hmm. How would you say your guiding philosophy in work has affected you in other parts of life? Well, Wing Chun is something, uh, it, it's, it's a system of martial arts where it doesn't rely on you have to be big, you have to be strong. It's, it's the technique. It's being precise about what you're doing. Um, it's paying attention to the details. That's something that I've gotten from Wing Chun that has carried over into other areas of my life. You know, anything that you do, uh, you know, I, I want to do it properly. Uh, you know, I want to dot the I's and cross the T's because things just tend to work better that way. Mm-hmm. So, um, studying Wing Chun, the, the general philosophy of Wing Chun about honing your technique and, and keeping it precise is something I've tried to take over to other areas of my, my personal life. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's served me well. It really it gives one a direction. It gives you a, a chance to improve and uh, focus on who you are as a person and how you live your life mm-hmm. with, the same, with the same amount of uh, precision you know, and focus on doing it well. Yeah. What, what would you say some of your students have said about, oh, man, when you taught me that, I've never heard that before. What are some of those things that, you know, you've pointed out for them that have been really helpful? Uh, not, not so much things, I guess, that people haven't heard before. Um, but one of the things that I always stress to my students, and this is uh, something a lot of my colleagues in Kung Fu uh, will, will say definitely, uh, uh, Kung Fu is a numbers game. It's about repetition. It's about doing something over and over and over and over. And the thing that makes you better skill-wise than the person next to you in class is how many more repetitions of something you've done. So mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 the issue is, is you, know, you have to have that repetition, but as an instructor, I have to find ways to give the students that, uh, that repetition without it being boring. Right. But there's no way around it. You know, Tiger Woods, how did he get good? Swinging that golf club thousands and thousands of times. Michael Jordan, how did he get good at free throws? He was probably there in the gym, midnight, late at night, everyone else is gone. He's just sitting there sinking baskets. That's, there, there's no way around having to do the hard work. And, that's and right. uh, yeah, and that's, and it's actually, it's a very egalitarian thing. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, if you're skinny or fat, if you're the, the most talented guy in the class, or if you're the clumsiest person in the school, it's all about the number of repetitions that need to be done to get you to where you need to be. And nothing stops you from doing that except your own mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good because anyone can do that if they're willing to put in the time Mm -hmm. and effort. Absolutely. So what other advice do you give to um, people that you're coaching when, when folks, um, you know, and it's the beginning of the year, it's January, February, so you get all the uh, New Year's resolution folks that come in and sign up, and we usually get a wave of people. Uh, I stress to them, you know, when you start something, see it through. Uh, mm-hmm. When I lived in Germany, you know, I, I'm fairly fluent, a little rusty, but fairly fluent in German still. And there's a saying in Germany, alle Anfang ist schwer, which means the beginning is always hard. Mm. And anything you do, if you go to a new job, you're uh, going to take piano lessons, um, you're going to tr- study martial arts, you know, anything you're going to do, the beginning is always, naturally, is, is the hardest period. And you have to stick with it. If you'll just see it through, and like I said, it's a numbers game, just put in your time. You know, get in, come in your, you know, two days a week, three days a week, whatever it is you train, uh, and just just do what you're supposed to do and let some time go by. And when that time goes by, things start working themselves out if you've put in your, done your due diligence and, and put in your repetitions. So, unfortunately, you know, the New Year's resolution crowd at this time of the year, we're going to have, you know, out of every 10 people that signs up, there will probably be one person that sticks with it three or four years, five years, long enough to get like their, you know, first level, first degree, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It's it's really it's really uh, as an instructor it's really disheartening. Um, so many people join 
anything, martial arts or whatever, thinking that it's going to be easy because they've seen it on TV or the movies. And then they find out, wow, yeah, there's uh, there's really some real work involved. And right. um, those folks tend to fall by the wayside. But I can tell you, the people that stay and the people that train anything, they're the people that become the experts. The experts mm-hmm. are just the people that just decided to quit. I'm sorry, we got cut off for a minute there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think I heard you said. Did you, did you get the last, last part? part? Repeat that last part. The people that become the experts are the people that basically just never quit. They stuck mm-hmm. with it. Right. And they're willing to accept that it may take some hard work. Sure. It's, it's, a, li- it's a lifelong journey. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not a destination. Yeah. Right. So what do you feel like is the most rewarding part of it after you've put in some of the work? Uh, you mean on the student side or as an instructor for myself? I guess, I guess both, but I'm thinking more from a student perspective. What are, what are some of those rewards that they get from working hard at it? Well, from the student perspective, uh, first off, it is a phys- Kung Fu is a physical activity. Um, they become stronger. They become more flexible. Uh, their reflexes are improved. You know, when you're standing in stances and and throwing punches and doing kicks and doing things like that, uh, grappling with people as opposed to uh, sitting in front of a computer, you know, at work typing all day, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to develop physically. It's just going to happen. It's, you know, you do the work, your body will develop. It's it's kind of designed that way. Uh, But then there's also the the mental and spiritual and, you know, let's say the emotional aspects of it. I remember when I was in the Air Force, uh, you know, you've got a commander you've got to answer to, and you've got a mission to accomplish and um, deadlines. And, you know, there, there were some rough days and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, you get to the end of the day, and you as an individual have to make that decision. Yeah, I'm kind of tired. Yeah, it's been a rough day. Am I going to train? You have mm-hmm. to make that decision. And the people that go, well, no, I'm just going to go home and sleep this one off. Those are the people that don't get ahead. Mm-hmm. You know, I had so many occasions where it's like, oh, it was a really rough day or, you know, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I just need to go, need to go home. But then I thought, you know, I'm in Germany. I have a chance to train here in the European Wing Chun Organization, the EWTO, uh, under Grandmaster Keith Kernspect. And I have an opportunity to train and get some great Wing Chun. And when I get out of the Air Force, bring it back to the States. And that was the thing that motivated me when I didn't feel like training, to get my butt in there and train. And, you know, the beauty of it is, is after you train, you feel better anyway. Uh, yeah. From the phys- right. You know, physically, you know, you're, you're working out, you're sweating, your body's uh, producing endorphins. You're going to feel better. When you're focusing on per- uh, perfecting a technique, or trying to do something that uh, requires some coordination, you have to kind of work at it. Your focus is on that to the exclusion of all these other things in your life, the dog eating your homework and the, uh, you know, uh, this and that and the boss yelling and, and whatever's going on. Uh, when you focus on your technique, you're excluding all these other things and giving yourself really your uh, uh, mental break, giving your brain a break. And you leave at the end of a class physically and mentally feeling better than when you went in mm-hmm. yeah but now if you have the now if, i was just to say if you have the flu don't show up to my class <laughs> you know we're not <laughs> saying show up if you're like seriously ill but uh you know people get fatigue and they get tension and uh you know restlessness and things like this and a lot of these things if you jump in and do some martial arts you know go into your class train for an hour two hours you'll come out feeling better you know Hmm. Yeah, I know. Nobody ever finishes a workout and says, "Oh, I wish I hadn't done that. That was too hard." You know, you, you exactly. have a sense, sense of satisfaction that you did it, and um, it mm-hmm. keeps you going further in other parts of your life. It's kind of funny. Builds... I remember. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say. I, you know, I remember. Um, hearing that even just making your bed in the morning has, you know, lasting <laughs> effects for the rest of the day because it just it, it gives it gives you that sense that you've accomplished something, starts your day off right, and then you have the motivation to keep going and doing other well, productive things. It's funny. It's it's funny you mention that because I do that every day. It's something that stuck with me from the military, and um, I saw a YouTube video. There was a a, a Navy admiral, and he's a SEAL, Navy SEAL. 
And he did a speech down here in Austin at the University of Texas, a commencement speech. And he started off talking about getting up in the morning and making your bed. And he said, mm-hmm. you know, it, it may seem like a mundane thing, a very, you know, what does it matter? He goes, but it's the one thing you start your day off with that you make a routine that you stick to. That, you know, that helps build your discipline, your self discipline, your stick to itiveness. And he goes, mm-hmm. it sets a, a course for, for, success for the rest of the day you know and when you go home at night he said at least you have a made you know there's a made bed to get into um so yeah i yeah. uh i totally i totally believe in that and that's what we did when i was in the military you know the yeah. the martial arts and the military you, right you know this there there are a lot of similarities like martial art and military art mm-hmm. um there are things that you have to do things that are required you're put through a regiment of training and by being put in a, uh, let's say, put under a framework of discipline where someone's making you do something, through time and habit, you develop self-discipline, and then you're able to do that for yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's one of the takeaways that you get from martial arts that, you know, is is really a good thing. Right. What do you do, though, for someone who's just like, you know what, I keep working at it, it's not getting easier things aren't going well, like, how do you help people to, as our themes, um, podcast theme is stay in the game? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I first came back to the States, uh, I got out of the Air Force in late 95, came back, started getting my group together and teaching. I I decided early on, I had a three-point criteria for the students. If they wanted to progress, they wanted to move up in rank, uh, you know, what am I looking for? And I call it the three A's, attendance, Ability and attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, attendance is the uh, you know it's like uh, it's like going to public school. You know if you don't show up, they're they're going to call the truancy officer and you know they're going to come looking for you. Attendance is the the basic thing. If you expect to achieve anything in any endeavor, you have to be there. You have to show up for the game first off. Right. Um, if you do, the second A comes into play. Ability. If you train regularly. You know, if you're doing push-ups, if you're doing sit-ups, if you're pushing weights, if you're throwing thousands and thousands of kicks, the ability is going to come one way or the other. It is going to come if you put your heart into it and you've done the numbers. Um, You know, so I look for people that have good attendance. If they have good attendance, generally they're going to develop, you know, the ability is going to come with time. But the third one is the most important is attitude. It's having a proper attitude towards, you know, their instructor, towards their classmates, um, even the proper, you know, mindset. Let's say as part of their attitude, their mindset, their attitude towards themselves, and their dedication, their training. You know, that's the most important. Mm-hmm. When I was um, uh, when I was in the Air Force, you know, I was just a, uh, an enlisted person. Um, I worked in a computer facility that uh, facilitated uh, war planning and that sort of thing. I wasn't a special ops guy, but I like to watch these shows about. Air Force para-jumpers and uh, Air Force combat controllers and Navy SEALs. And I've got a, a few guys in my school, former Army Rangers. And if you ask any of those guys that went through one of those special ops schools, they'll tell you, yeah, it was physically enduring, but the thing that got people through it at the end of the day, the guys that had the right mindset were the ones that were able to deal with it and achieve. And the ones that didn't have the right mindset were the ones that were ringing the bell and, uh, and clocking out. And I I totally believe that in martial arts, too. It's 100% correct. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm sure that you give some of that advice in your book that I wanted you to talk about. So, Mm -hmm. The Empty Cup, um, which is available on Amazon. Yes, it is. And, um, you know, some of the comments are that you teach people that we can all continue to improve. Um, We can find joy from martial arts training. Um, what are some other lessons that you feel you're um, focusing on in this book? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat? Uh, what are some of the other lessons on mindset and achievement that you're focusing on in that book? Okay. The book is broken down into eight chapters, um, and it is by by design. It's a shorter book. It's one of these books that you could sit down and, you know, read in one sitting, you know, a couple mm-hmm. hours, that sort of thing. Uh, so, the first chapter uh, shares the same name as the title of the book, The Empty Cup, which is a parable that's pretty well known in martial arts and deals essentially with 
being an empty cup, being an open vessel, um, open to any new knowledge that's coming in. And mm-hmm. the parable, you know, there's all sorts of variations of the story, but the parable generally runs. There's a, a young person seeking, you know, knowledge, experience. He goes to an elderly sage, comes in. The sage brings him in. They sit down to have some tea. And he's asking the sage for knowledge, but he's spending the majority of his time telling the sage what he already knows and how good he is and how he does this and how he does that. So he's not really open. He's already kind of full. <laughs> he's full of himself, I guess you could say in a, in, in a modern term. He's kind of full of himself. And yeah. um, so the sage is pouring him some tea, and the you know, sage fills his cup. And then keeps pouring, and the cup fills, and it spills over onto this young guy. And the young guy gets upset and stops talking about himself, and he kind of yells at the sage, Hey, what are you doing? Can't you see my cup is already full? And the sage goes, I can see it. Why can't you? Mm-hmm. You know, and it's kind of one of those pithy little stories that, you know, uh, I look at it this way. Um, we talked earlier about my, my firearms experience and the things I do. Uh, mm-hmm. I work with a couple of guys that they were cops, two brothers. Um, they're retired gentlemen now. They work there. They were cops in L.A. back in the 70s and 80s. And each one of these guys has, in real life, six or seven actual gun battles under their belt. And they're still mm-hmm. alive. Wow. And so I am the expert on Wing Chun, but I am not as much of an expert on, you know, those kind of situations and firearms as these guys are. They've forgotten more about firearms than most people know. So when I go to them, I don't go to them, I'm Jeff Webb, I'm uh, a Wing Chun master. I go to them, hi, what am I doing wrong when I'm shooting? Look at my target. Here's where the shots are going. How can I get better? Anything you say for me to do to change what I'm doing or to make my technique better, I'll do. So that's Mm -hmm. the approach I take. Um, You know, one has to be willing if you do want to progress, if you do want to be good, you have to have an empty cup. Um, yeah. the same thing when I uh, uh, the same thing when I teach the security guards. When they come in, uh, these guys, you know, half the people are ex-military or ex-law enforcement, and um, they're just wanting to get a secure, security guard job on the side to make a little extra money. And then you get a bunch of other people who have very, I mean, no exposure to martial arts, weaponless defense, or anything. And I always tell those folks, for you guys that have experience, you know, we've got three hours. The state regulates, you know, how long I'm supposed to teach you. And we have three hours for me to give you whatever I can. If you find one thing that works for you, then, you know, take it into your, you know, put it in your repertoire. But I say to all the students, be open-minded. You know, don't come in that you know everything. Come in open to anything because if you come in with a closed mind, you're automatically – uh, blocking out information and knowledge that could be useful to you. You're disregarding right. it beforehand. So mm-hmm. that's the first chapter. The other chapters deal with things like focus, patience, uh, having trust for your instructor and their training method, uh, looking at the training from the right perspective. Of course, having humility, uh, you know, not letting your ego, you know, control what you're doing. Let your work ethic, your hard work control what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, of course, the, the very last of the chapters, as we said, is about hard work is literally, you know, you can have the best teacher on the planet, but it takes a great teacher and it takes a hardworking student. You can't have just one. You, can't, you have to have both. And so your, your instructor may be the best instructor on the planet, but he can show you, but you're the one that has to do the actual hard work. Yeah. You're the one that has to put in those repetitions, yeah? Mm-hmm. So I love that because it doesn't mean you have to be the smartest or the most talented. You just have to be teachable. Mm-hmm. And these are, you can anyone can succeed if they have a teachable attitude and are willing to put in the work. Right, right, absolutely. And you know, back to the uh, the the gun range thing, we have people come in the gun range who are retired military, retired law enforcement, or people that are just civilians that have been shooting their entire life. And well, you know, they'll say they you know they point the gun the wrong direction or something happens, and we have to say, hey, you know, make sure you keep it pointed in a safe direction. And the people that are the most experienced and the best at what they do say, oh, I'm very sorry. If you see me doing anything wrong, you know, if I point it the wrong way or whatever, uh, you just let me know. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other extreme of people that, you know, they may be new to it, but they don't want anyone telling them what to do. 
It's like, well, you know, the, the more advanced people, just like in martial arts, the, the more advanced you get, the more humble you should be. The more you should be, you know, the, the more you realize that you don't know. Yeah. You know, Bruce Lee had the, that saying one time, and he said something to the effect that, uh, you know, before he started training in martial arts, a punch was just a punch. And after he trained for a few years in martial arts, then a punch became, it was something else. It was this, you know, thing, this, this special thing. But then after he had trained a very long time, he came back full circle to realizing the punch is just a punch. Hmm. And, you know, so the more advanced you get in martial arts, you should have a more um, open view towards, towards other martial artists and, uh, you know, learning things. And as a teacher, hey, if you're a master... You know, the, the learning should never stop. And for me, I love learning more. I learn through mm-hmm. teaching. You know, I, um, I have a number of students mm-hmm. right now uh, that are assistant instructors. They're getting ready for their, um, their second levels, working on their third degree, third level. And uh, all of these guys have just started working on the wooden dummy form. So it's like, well, how many people have you taught wooden dummy form to? of the higher mm-hmm. programs. So I made a joke to some of my older students. I'm like, well, you know, your younger, your, your first students aren't your best work, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, as a, like, I guess I, I don't have kids, but I'm sure as a parent, you know, my dad would tell you, I'm not his best work. My two younger brothers are probably, he did a lot better with them along the way. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, um, there's truth you know, to that. Yeah. So, you know, when you're an instructor, it's the same thing. If you've taught, an advanced program that you may know, but you've taught it to one person for the first time, you're probably not the best at relaying that information. But years and years go by, and when it's the 30th, 40th, 50th, 60th person that you've taught that information to, not only are you better at conveying it, but you see things. I mean, one of my students asked a question about the dummy the other day, and in the process of me trying to correct him and explain what I needed to explain to him, I came to a realization and I've been doing this for decades. So mm-hmm. it, it's, it, that is what gives me satisfaction. I love seeing students progress. Uh, I've, I've had you know, st- uh, students come in who had been bullied, had been pushed around. I, I think of one gentleman in particular. He, uh, he didn't talk a lot about it, but it was very clear. He, he grew up in a very abusive home. His father was uh, obviously very physically abusive to him. And, you know, when he would work or spar with other people, he was very timid. And he trained with me all the way up to his fourth degree. He trained with me for 10, 12 years, 12, no, 12 or 14 years, yeah. And, um, you know, when someone would uh, do something in class or, you know, throw an attack, boom, he'll jump right in and do it. And he really, it, it, it helped him heal something that had been done to him in the past. He that self-confidence that he needed. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me as an instructor, that's that's what I get the most joy out of is is seeing people progress, seeing them grow. Um, I think from a student's perspective too, if they see that their teacher or their instructor is still willing to learn, then it's inspiring and motivating, not just like oh this guy thinks he knows it all, you know. So mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it helps you to be a better teacher as well when you have that lifelong. Um, goal of learning that it's never ending sure i i definitely agree with that i remember when i was a lot younger uh you know print media is dead these days but when i was a kid i used to buy black belt and inside kung fu magazine and and then these things and i remember seeing a news story in there about chuck norris and he had started training gracie jiu-jitsu with the machado brothers Mm -hmm. and much like you said i saw that and i thought wow that's chuck norris and now he's trying to learn jujitsu, and he's studying under these guys. And I, as a martial artist, you know, I thought that was impressive. You know mm-hmm. that he he's he really is this kind of humble person. He really is this open minded person. And uh, yeah, it, it impressed me. You know, so I agree with you one hundred percent. It's uh, it's inspiring to see your teacher willing to explore and change things and learn and you know develop things and and learn more. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, if you're willing to share, I'd like to know, what are some of your greatest lessons that you've learned, either successes or failures in life? Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing that my instructor, uh, Grandmaster Lungting, one thing he said at a seminar really stuck with me. And uh, I was younger when 
you know, someone asked him a question. He gave an answer. I'll, I'll elaborate on it. I was younger when this took place, and it didn't resonate with me as much then as it does now that I'm older. And I'm talking mm-hmm. about like 20, 20 years ago. Um, I just turned 49, so I was probably, yeah, well, I wasn't even 30 then. Um, someone asked him a question at a seminar. You know, we have the training, and then afterwards, you know, there's kind of people can ask him questions. And someone asked him, said, well, you know, you're a grandmaster, and you, you trained with Grandmaster Yip Man, and, uh, you know, you fought in tournaments, and you've, you've taught all over the world, and you've traveled, and you've taught special forces people and police, and, you know, all of this. You've taught champions. What, what is the most important thing that you ever learned? And, uh, you know, everyone goes to, um, you know, a, an advanced instructor or something, and they want that one nugget. What's the most important nugget of knowledge there is to have? Mm-hmm. And um, I was very curious as to how he was going to answer this because, uh, yeah, I wanted to know too. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of it was it was very interesting. He said the most important thing I learned is that sometimes you lose. Mm-hmm. And I thought, how profound! And the older I've gotten, uh, you know, things happen in life and stuff like that. You experience things. Um, you know, everything, relationships and growing a business and, you know, the ups and downs of life and stuff like that. And and he's right. Uh, the, the most important lesson you can learn is that sometimes you do lose. And it's how you handle that and get beyond it is what makes you into the person that you're going to be. It's right. facing it with confidence and determination that, okay, I'm faced with a rough situation or, okay, I fought in this tournament and I got beat. Well, you know, Chuck Norris got beat. You know, uh, uh, fighting tournaments. I remember there was. A, I read an article about this one fighter, uh, Tony Tony Tullinurs, I think was the gentleman's name. Some guy fighting back in the in the sixties, and you know the the article said the guy Chuck Norris couldn't beat. Chuck Norris, mm-hmm. everyone loves him. He's a champion. Yeah. Everyone looks up to him. I, I've you know I read his bio. I've looked up to him since I was a kid. But hey, uh, everyone gets beat or defeated or they lose something somewhere at some time in their life. It's how mm-hmm. you how you handle that is what makes the difference. Right. And so yeah, that so that's something I learned from my instructor, and that's something that you know I've told that I've repeated that to students. They'll say, you know, what's one of the most important things you learn? Well, sometimes you do lose, and you have to mm-hmm. deal with it. You know, in right. a in a productive way. Yeah, and I think it's key being being defeated in an event or in you know one circumstance in life shouldn't lead you to feel like defeated altogether. You know. Sure. And, sure. So, um, well, uh, if I can, can I dovetail into that for just yeah. a second? Mm-hmm. So, you know, my, uh, my mother, uh, God love her. She's in her seventies. She has raised horses her entire life. She's still out there at 75 messing with horses. That's and awesome. she can tell you, yeah, she can tell you, uh, you take a horse and until you break that horse saddle, break it, you know, you put the saddle on it and you ride it and it gets used to, it has to figure out. You're not getting off, and it better get used to having a person on it. So you have to, it's called breaking the horse. Mm-hmm. And basically, somebody has to saddle this crazy horse, get on it, and ride it, and it'll buck, and it'll throw, and it'll try to get you off. But you have to break that horse before it becomes learnable and can achieve its full potential as a race mm-hmm. horse or as anything. And, yeah. um, you know, that's, that's exactly the same thing uh, we as humans. Sometimes we have to, to reach that stage where we're, you know, we're broken, we're defeated or whatever before we learn some of the most valuable lessons. And I, I think that that's really what my instructor was trying to impart. It's, and it's totally true. I mean, I've, by experience, I can tell you it's true. Yeah. Well, tell me, what are some other projects that are going to follow this book that you wrote, The Empty Cup? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, when I first started writing The Empty Cup, and I was, uh, you know, putting the idea past some of my assistant instructors, uh, one of them, and he's an older gentleman, he's actually the oldest guy in my school, he's 76, um, very interesting fellow, he was a, uh, a private student of June Rhee, and for folks who don't know June Rhee, June Rhee is one of the first gentlemen that brought Taekwondo to America back in the in the 60s mm-hmm. and uh so so this guy his name is harry Hare Lundell, a very wise gentleman and he goes you know he, i'm a sifu he goes you know sifu you know when people write books you should write them in threes you know everyone likes threes mm-hmm. there's like you know like look at the star wars movies there's you know star wars and empire strikes back return of the jedi and you know the lord of the rings there's three movies everything's in threes 
And so he asked me, you know, if you write The Empty Cup, do you have thoughts on writing, you know, a, a sequel and maybe a third one? Mm-hmm. Uh, and in fact, I, in fact, I do, and I did. And the uh, the second book, which is to follow up the empty cup, is entitled "The Broken Rice Bowl." Mm-hmm. And uh, while the empty cup is geared primarily towards students, um, although it's good for folks of all ranks, would love to read it. it, it it's really a good read. Yeah. Um, the The Broken Rice Bowl is geared specifically towards assistant instructors, instructors. And people that are running martial arts schools and martial arts organizations. Uh, and so just as the empty cup comes from a parable, the term broken rice bowl uh, comes from Chinese culture. So the rice bowl is the way that you feed yourself. You know, you everyone has their own little rice bowl and you serve from the big dish into your rice bowl and then you feed yourself from your rice bowl. So in Chinese culture, the rice bowl is analogous to your the way you put food on the table, the way you make money, your career, your you know your business, that mm-hmm. sort of thing, and so much so that, uh, for example, if you have a government job in China, it's called you have an iron rice bowl. You know, if you work for the mm-hmm. government, you've got government benefits, and you're connected, and you've got you know you know people that know people, so that's called an iron rice bowl. Well, if you break your rice bowl. Breaking your rice bowl means you destroy your means of sustaining yourself and your your family and your income and that sort of thing. And the this book is geared towards again instructors because I've I've studied here in the USA. I've studied in Europe. Uh, also went to Hong Kong, and while I was there, I trained with my own, own Sifu. I trained with some other masters uh, in that organization while I was over there. You know, I wanted to touch hands with as many people as I could. I've uh, I've had a lot of good experiences learning from some instructors, and I've had a few that were bad, and I've had some that were extremely bad. Um, and a lot of them had to do with not the instructor's level of skill, mm-hmm. but going back to who that person is on the inside. You know, just because someone is skillful, it doesn't mean that they're a saint. Uh, you know, we, we you watch the Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi is very skilled, and he's also a nice guy. But yeah. you look in the same movie, and you've got uh, Kreese, the Cobra Kai instructor. He's very skilled, but he's a bad guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've experienced both, you know, in all the years I've been training. I've had training with people that uh, I, I really had respect for and learned a lot from, and had people that uh, I would never go to another seminar with them again, not because they didn't have anything to share of value, just how they treated people, who they were. So there are mistakes that instructors can make, and some of them are uh, – you know, unintentional. Uh, others are just, you know, that's who that person is. And so in the broken rice bowl, I go through and I outline some of these mistakes that I've seen um, that cause instructors to to break their rice bowl, to, to limit or uh, destroy their own careers uh-huh. simply because of the way that they teach, the, the way that they treat people. Right, right. So that's... Uh, uh, the natural follow-up to the empty cup, and then uh, as for the third book, well, I, I've got some ideas on that, but I'm still throwing mm-hmm. them around. Nothing, nothing has solidified uh, to the point where I want to announce anything, so I'm, yeah. I'm still working on that. Well, you're committed I'll give it a lot now. Of thought. <laughs> I am now. Yes, I guess if, uh, if people hear this, they're going to be asking for it. So, uh, yeah. but that's good. That's good. Yeah. That means I'm I'm accountable to your listeners. If someone wants that's to read right. the book, and uh, I'm accountable to get that out and uh, give them something to enjoy. Well, and let us know right now. How can our listeners get in touch with you or find out more about what you're up to? Uh, you can go to our website, which is www.national vt.com so we spell Wing Chun the way they spell it in Hong Kong which is V-I-N-G T-S-U-N so it's nationalvt.com and from there uh, you can find out how to contact our organization, send us an email give us a phone call uh, and if it relates to my books as well uh, I put together a blog that's out there um, and it's the Empty Cup blog and uh so it's through WordPress, and uh, to be honest with you, I don't uh, remember the URL off the top of my head. But um, I will, uh, I can get that to you guys as well. And uh, I haven't done as much work on that as to you know the holidays come up and things get busy. But it's meant to be something to kind of supplement uh, the books that I'm writing, add some additional thoughts, and that sort of thing. 
Right, right. Well, what, what we do is we'll post show notes after this podcast, and we can have links okay. to those sites that you mentioned. So, ah, great. Yeah, that would be, be perfect. Great. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time and you coming and sharing your thoughts with us. It's been really insightful, and I hope our listeners will get in touch with you and find out more great tips. Great. Well, Janelle, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. To learn more from Dai Seafood Jeff, be sure to visit us at plumdragonherbs.com. We will post show notes, a transcript, and ways to connect with him. And if you liked what you heard today, we hope you'll send us some love back by subscribing to our show on YouTube, iTunes, or wherever you like to listen, and leave us a comment. We've got a lot of great shows lined up, and we hope you'll stick with us. Until next time.